Hello, everyone. Greetings. You have arrived at Facing Climate Change, the 2022 edition of our international gathering under the heading of Focus on Conservation. Before we formally begin, a few words of welcome from our brilliant and tireless organizers, Sophie Rowe, Peter Gire, Marisa Pamplona, and Till Krieg. So hello, I'm Sophie Rowe from the University of Cambridge Museums, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our conference. This is the second time the Leibniz Research Museums and the University of Cambridge Museums have hosted a joint conference online, focusing on one of the big challenges in conservation. So the first time was in 2020, when each of us had planned our own in-person conference on the conservation of plastics, and the COVID pandemic forced us to think creatively, and it led to a happy partnership that hosted the Plastics in Peril conference in Zoom in November 2020. And that conference was so successful that we decided to work together again, this time addressing the biggest issue, not just in conservation, but in the world. So there are still a lot more questions than answers about how to reduce the carbon footprint of cultural heritage preservation. So as well as some more traditional presentations, we've included in this meeting some open conversations where people working in the field can speak informally and from the heart. And we hope that this will stimulate lots of thought, discussion and action, not just in this meeting, but after it, in the places where you all work. And now I'm going to hand over to Peter Gierer from the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Thanks, Sophie. Um, yeah, this conference is the fifth of a series in, of meetings called Focus on Conservation. Uh, as you've seen, that's the, the primary, the, the, the initial title of this conference. And all of these were funded by the um, Leibniz Aktionsplan, a, ded a dedicated fund for the uh, Leibniz Research Museums. And this generous report um, from the Leibniz Aktionsplan has allowed us not only to make the con this conference in the series free to attend, but also um, to have the videos produced of the meeting, which will be um, free to view on University of Cambridge Museum's YouTube channel from early in 2023. We would like to dedicate this conference to Professor Stefan Rügerhoff, and maybe we can have a picture. Um, yeah, there he is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, to Professor Stefan Brugerhoff, the recently retired head of the German Mining Museum, who was a key person in originally bringing the Leibniz network, network of research museums together, and that is the, uh, the network conservation uh, um, restoration, and that was in, in 2015, and he's, he also energetically supported the development of this conference series. Um, and keeping with his vision, our themes over the next four days focus particularly on aspects of climate change, affecting conservators, uh, and, and sustainable pest management, preventive care for collection, sustainable conservation practices, and education for professionals and trainee uh, conservators. And this indeed is one of his topics, uh, which he was really interested in. Now, I will hand over to Marisa Pamplona from the Deutsches Museum in, Mun in Munich. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, the Leibniz Association includes a network of eight research museums and, is, um, and University of Cambridge Museums is also a group of eight museums. By joining our two small networks together to run a virtual conference on conservation in 2020, we found that we were able to reach far more people than we would have been able to do so on our own. In that meeting and this one, as well as in this one, we have participants from every continent on Earth, except Antarctica, including many people who would never be able to travel to meet in person. Our experience working together has shown us the power of online connections to share vision and ideas, and also to inspire and empower colleagues to improve the care of collections wherever they are. We very much hope this meeting will help you make new connections and build your own networks. And we have organized a range of different breakout sessions every day to help you do that. Now to Till Creek from the German Mining Museum in Bochum. Thank you, Marisa. It is often said that climate change is a global problem with requires global solutions. 
And that is even more reason why we should reach out to colleagues all over the world to find more sustainable ways of working. The problem of climate change has recently become much more acute with the energy crisis facing many countries. The carbon footprint of museums can be extremely high, while many cultural heritage institutions have small financial resources and are having to make hard decisions about how to use them. These problems are not found in just one area, they are shared by many museums across both the Global South and Global North. That is why we are particularly happy to have contributors from across the whole world at this meeting to share ideas of how to work more sustainably and cost effectively. Last but not least, we are delighted to have Katja Zelyat moderating the meeting for us again this year. Thank you, Katja, and back to you. Thank you, thank you all. It is a wonderful group of people that we've been working with for three years, uh, which has always been a joy for me in the winter season here uh, in Germany. My name is Katja Zelyat and I had international outreach activities for the Leibniz Research Museums in Germany. I will be your moderator for Facing Climate Change over the next four days. Apologies. Um, my office is on the corner of a, um, an intersection that goes straight to the major hospital in Berlin. So <laughs> we are facing all kinds of different things <laughs> at the corner of Invalidenstraße and Chausseestraße. Just to make sure we're all on board, here are the most important things you need to know to participate in the conference fully and effectively. First of all, please make sure that you have installed the latest version of Zoom. Um, that is important because sometimes you aren't able to connect with all of the things that you might need to connect with if you haven't done that. Most parts of this conference are being recorded and will be made available to you on the University of Cambridge Museum's YouTube channel in the future, as you heard before. To that end, please turn off your video when you are part of the audience. And everybody except the speakers is part of the audience for most of the time. <laughs> As you know from your conference materials and from the disclaimer slide you saw when you entered this Zoom meeting, you are granting the organizers rights to use your picture if you do not turn off your video. So if you do not want people to see what you look like today, turn off your video. To allow for good sound quality, our um, technical staff will mute all audience members during the dialogues and the sessions. So now these are perhaps even more important. If you have any issues hearing, seeing, or communicating during the sessions, place these administrative questions and problems into the Zoom chat to everyone. Rest assured, we have helpers standing by to read your cries for help, um, but do not target specific people and particularly not those on the organizational team because they are doing a lot of back end work. To pose questions to speakers during the question and answer period after our dialogues and sessions, do not use the Zoom chat as you might think you might want to do. Instead, please use the Slido questioning and polling tool. Um, you are going to have a slide. I hope you see a slide right now that shows you the URL of Slido. And you can use that URL to enter the code facing climate change, all one word, all small, um, small letters to take part in, um, in the poll, just to get us set up to figure out um, how Slido works. We are using Slido instead of Zoom chat because you can add your own questions here and also you can rate 
the questions that other people ask. So if you particularly like a question, um, then you can star it and it will be more likely to end up in my feed to ask um, the presenters when it comes to the question and answer period. So um, I will also I will also let you know how to enter breakout rooms at the end of each question and answer session. All right. Now, just a bit about our conference attitude. <laughs> um, not attitude, but attitude with sunshine. We hope that you participants see this conference as we do. It's a conversation, and that means that it may take some unexpected twists and turns. We hope that we'll, you will be inspired and empowered by this meeting and feel like active participants. And in the spirit of an open and positive conversation, it goes without saying that we must treat everyone with courtesy and respect. We are excited to have delegates from so many different countries and time zones, and we want to make sure this digital meeting works for everybody. So please do let us know if you are having technical issues and put them into the Zoom chat to everyone. Most of all, have fun and thank you so much for joining us. All right, now if I can have, um, our technical staff tell us um, where everybody is from. Ah, can you all see it on your poll? So UK, Germany, United Kingdom seems not to be the same as UK, haha. <laughs> Chile, Norway, Czech Republic, excellent. So you've all figured out how to use Slido which is wonderful. So then in the question and answer period, we will be swamped with your rated questions. All right, now to begin, we will start with the opening dialogue. Please, as we said, use Slido to pose questions for me to ask our speakers after the presentation. I see that both of our speakers have, uh, have their video on. I will introduce uh, both of them to you right now. <laughs> Angelica Isa Adania completed her MA studies in conservation of archeological and museum objects at the University of Durham in UK in 2015. <laughs> she currently works at the Pachacamac Museum in Lima, Peru, and is a community member uh, excuse me, a community board member for environmental monitoring company Conserve. She is vice chair of the Talent and Participation Committee for the International Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, IIC. A longer biography um, is in the conference materials. Our um, die of the dialoguer is uh, Pascal Kverna, who is a biologist and expert on integrated pest management in museums. He currently works at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, where he is leading a research project on climate change and museum pests, insects, and fungi in Austria. All right, so we're going to start this dialogue um, with Angelica talking a little bit about uh, her work and a little bit about um, things that relate to our day's theme of pest management. And then Pascal uh, will talk a little bit about his work and then we will see uh, where the dialogue takes us. Hopefully they will have questions from each other. And if, um, if there's a, a little lull, I will step in with some of your questions or other questions. All right, Angelica, Thank take it away. Thank you, Katia. Good morning. Um, well, good morning if you are in the Americas right now. Good afternoon if you're in Europe. Maybe good evening. I didn't quite see if there were people further over. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I have been working for the past few years on sustainable 
pest control or at least research into sustainable pest control um, because we have a very particular, very destructive beetle in Peru that we did not know very much about a few years ago. Um, and we also have a very interesting local Andean plant that has um, very effective uh, repelling properties, it seems, in 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 nature, in traditional agriculture in Peru. Um, so we have been looking into how to harness the power of this particular plant um, and use it to try to repel these insects from attacking our organic collections. Um, and I, I do believe there is a presentation on this um, coming out later um, when we are showing all the presentations. So I don't want to maybe give too much away um, so that you can all watch the presentation later. Um, but I will definitely answer you know, more questions regarding the background and the meaning behind using um, local sustainable solutions and trying to find uh, solutions that are not just good, you know, for our economies and good for the projects and good for conservation, but actually also um, harmless or as harmless as we can make them to the uh, to the environment around us. Yeah, so, Angelica, I find this uh, this approach from you very very interesting and very inspiring. I think. Um, in Central Europe, we have been using the same treatment methods already for decades and uh, usually uh, nothing new comes up. So I think it is interesting to, to look at traditional uh, ways to protect plants, animals, agricultural products, and also maybe museum objects from the uh, infestation and destruction from museum pests. We have been using different types of repellents in the past in, in Central Europe, like camphor, lavandula, uh, citronel oils, and so on. And we have stopped using those uh, because we found them not really very effective to protect our collections. And we also have seen that uh, some of them are um, maybe changing the surface of the materials. So the, the materials are re uh, reacting to the application and we found reinfestations when we have used them. So that's why in our IPM concepts, repellents are not an important part uh, of IPM at the moment, but I think it's always good to, to keep an eye open to new possibilities, new products that, uh, that might be used. And um, I think, this is this is the main aim of what we want to do in IPM. We want to protect our collections the best we can. And uh, if we have simple and sustainable solutions or natural products available, then we should use them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that yes, that's really interesting that you mention, um, you know, in Europe, there is uh, there isn't any more a practice of applying products to objects um, and collections. Um, because, you know, we have found that anoxia is better, freezing is better, um, you know, doing thermal treatments might be more appropriate. These things where you're not actually applying anything to the to the objects. Um, and these methods are definitely really good. The problem that we have found in Peru is that the the materials that we need to 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 make those methods work effectively um, are not available to us um you know for example the well the easiest thing we can do is freeze right and um just funnily enough recently we were trying to find a new freezer for this because the one that we have is is relatively small um and we didn't really have the possibility of having a big walk-in industrials type of freezer as as you see in in museums abroad um and we found nothing um we couldn't find a freezer that got to minus 30 that was different from the model we already have so which is not very big um so while we can use freezing it we you know we will have limitations on size and and an amount of object you know quantity that we can do at the same time and then thermal is simply not an option for us in you know if we did it in the way that uh, dr 
um, Cabral has done it in Sri Lanka with a box mm -hmm. in the sun, we might be able to, um, but we don't have, you know, the fancy options with the company that comes with its special uh, lorry with um, sort of controlled humidity. I mean, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> we don't have it <laughs> and we're not likely to get it. Um, mm -hmm. And anoxia, which is the other simple option, we don't have the plastic for it, right? It's very difficult for us to buy the escal. Um, and then we would have to find, you know, get the tanks and the, and the fittings. And if you have never done it before beyond learning about it, how are you going to set up a thing in your museum with gas tanks and fittings and bags you probably can't get most of the time. And if you do, you are going to be risking those bags because if you're still learning, you might ruin them, right? So there's all these steps to setting up an anoxia program that can be very high learning curves for us. Um, so we thought, well, you know, maybe an actual product that doesn't necessarily go on the object, but that we can put close by or on the box outside maybe that would be good enough so that's why we also you know thought it was worth it to look into um, local products that could actually be used as chemical um, deterrents for the insect yeah no I, I I completely agree with you uh can you can you tell me how you got the idea or or the inspiration of using a product which is actually used in agriculture to apply it also to a museum environment? Yeah, so I cannot take the credit for this. This was not my idea initially. Um, there is a paper from, I believe, 2013. I don't have it in front of me. I actually believe it was the ICOM conference in Rio. It was presented there um, by a colleague, um, Rosanna Kwon. And uh, she works with us here in Lima. And they did an experiment, a very you know, low level, nothing fancy, not in a lab experiment with tarwi seeds. And tarwi is this bean that we are talking about that grows in, in the Andes. Um, and she just did it with Angelica, an- Angelica, yes. could you, could you um, uh, spell the name of the plant? I think- Yes, it's tarwi, so T-A-R-W-I. Tarawi. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, so she, you know, we knew that there's a lot of alkaloids in these beans and these plants. So I think they bought, I think I'm, I don't have it in front of me. So I think they boiled it for a, some time and then they use that water from the boiled beans um, with uh, termites. And I think they might have given some, some, wood for them to eat they might have added the liquid onto some blocks of wood for them to eat etc you know several experiments um which is all in that paper from a long time ago and i think they then did uh you know they cut up the little termites which were dead um and they found that the mouth parts of the termites had sort of just kind of melted it just kind of ruined their mouth parts uh, which might not be very friendly for the animals. But basically what it did is it just made it impossible for the termites to keep eating, right? And then they died as well. So the they, they did find that Tawi had that property at that time. So when we thought about the, these new experiments for a different insect, um, we knew that it had worked before and that it was a product that was worth researching again. Um, because nobody, they didn't do any more tests after that one paper. So we thought it was something really important to rescue and to keep building on. Okay. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. Uh, I, uh, I was also the supervisor of a PhD student, Udaya Kapral, who we'll speak later. And uh, they used a natural product also in Sri Lanka against uh, pests which have been traditionally used on palm leaf uh, manuscripts already for centuries. And all those manuscripts are very well preserved. So this is, uh, shows that there is a positive reaction that uh, uh, similar pests like in your country, destructive beetles or termites, 
are actually not infesting the, the documents. And so he did some different tests also to see if it is effective in the laboratory. And um, I think preserving these traditional knowledges are very important. In, uh, in Europe, we have, for example, have now uh, conflicts in our treatment methods with the EU regulations. Everything is very regulated. Yeah. And for many years, for example, we could not use nitrogen uh, from generators in the museums because it was not regulated and was not allowed by the EU. So this is very, it shows that we are living in very different worlds that uh, we have maybe the, the, the possibilities, the funding and the, the, the machines to use nitrogen from generators in our museums. But the EU, for example, comes and regulates it, and then we cannot <laughs> use it for some time. Now the situation has changed, and in the future it will be possible again to apply it normally. But it shows that um, we are living in a very regulated world here. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, the reason why the EU is regulating it is because so many pesticide products are on the market. Yeah. And uh, they need to control it in some way that not uh, the chemical industry is putting up a new product with a new compound every year on the market. So that's why uh, those things are tested very uh, thoroughly. And uh, it's not only has to be proven that it is effective as a pesticide against the pest, but we also have to see environmental issues, is it, un is it uh, unhealthy for us humans? Is it unhealthy for the environment? So this is maybe also something for you to think about. Uh, if your product is working, it's great, but keep in mind that maybe it has also some environmental issues or maybe it also has some health issues for your staff who is applying it because only because a product is natural doesn't mean that it's not healthy for us especially yeah. if it's applied on a regular basis or in higher concentrations. Yes, yes, that's definitely um, a, definitely a concern, which is why we are still, you know, doing the research. Um, one of the things that we are excited about is that this plant is uh, edible most of the time. Once the alkaloids are washed out, they are edible and people do eat them here. Um, all it takes is soaking in water, so you don't even need to do anything harsh to get the alkaloids out. But of course, if it's the alkaloids that we are not eating most of the time, and if we concentrate them, um, that, that, you know, that would be something certainly that we would have to look into before saying it's okay to use. Um, that said, we have not concentrated the alkaloids we have gotten so far for our experiments. So what we have gotten so far from the experiments is literally from just soaking seeds or leaves in alcohol. Um, and we haven't done anything else to that to make it stronger. So it's working sort of as it is in a way. Um, in, in nature, it works as it is. The plants are put around crops to protect them, and that seems to be good enough. Not for all pests, but, you know, good enough. Um, so we do think it, it would be probably, you know, I can't say 100%, but it could be quite safe, which is, you know, it's, it's great. Um, and funny that you mention regulation in, in Europe. Because for us over here, um, I don't know about, I, I suspect it's similar in, in other Latin American countries, maybe not necessarily, maybe we're worse off, um, but uh, we don't regulate anything. <laughs> so <laughs> we are on the other side of that. And the problem of that is that when you have commercial products on the market, you know, normally when you're in Europe, in the States, things like that, they tell you, oh, you have to really look at, at the ingredients list and they could be lying to or they, you know, they could be lying to you. Or they could be they could have changed it, things like that. You have to be you know, careful here. When I look at the ingredients list, it will say things like active ingredient and solvent. And that's the list of ingredients. And I'm like, that's great. But I don't think I can apply this to objects or museums um, and unfortunately a lot of us do um, because you honestly don't know what's in there 
Um, or they will tell you maybe one of the ingredients, maybe the active ingredient, and they don't tell you anything else that is in that product. And you have no idea what is in that product. Um, so, you know, it's it's kind of like you can't use it because it's overregulated and we shouldn't use it because it's underregulated mm -hmm. as well. I'm going to jump in for a second. Um, I'm wondering, because we're, uh, the title of our conference is Facing Climate Change. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about pest behavior and climate change and how this might affect some of the of the ranges and some of the types of management that you are doing because now we've been talking about kind of a status quo but this is all changing and will be changing quite severely we think um in in the next decades maybe even months but certainly um within all of our lifetimes maybe you can both speak a little bit to that um either in your regions or just in general and don't hesitate to you know um i don't know go outside of your conservator persona <laughs> and make sweeping generalizations about everything if that's what we would like to do yeah maybe maybe i can start um uh... I'm very interested now in the topic of climate change and the uh, development of museum pests, as we have a project uh, focusing on this. And um, most often, insects are the pests that we are we are speaking about. And insects increase their activity and increase their reproduction when temperature goes up. So, if temp if climate changes means also increase of temperature in some regions in the world, this will have direct effects on the pests. Um, partly the pests which are outside of our buildings, in the forests, in nature, but uh, if, te if temperatures increase in the cities, it will also influence the indoor temperature. And this is what we are actually looking at in our project. And we already see changes here in Austria that uh, spring times are very warm and in the historic buildings which are still cold from winter time we have the warm air coming in from outside and we have problems of condensation and increase of fungi growth for example and this we have already observed in the last uh, couple of years and uh, we have a big problem of uh, introduced pests at the moment in austria like the gray silverfish which is a tropical species and it has spread across Europe in the last uh, decade. And it is probably now the most problematic pest for most of the museums in Austria. So uh, we have found some solutions to reduce the numbers and to regulate them, but they are still challenging. And of course, tropical species also profit from high temperatures. And uh, this is a problem which keeps us really busy. Uh, mm. Angelica, do you see the same uh, that you find new species or you are? Yeah. Um, you know, because we haven't actually been tracking them, it's hard to say if they are new. Um, okay. But I think one of the differences might be, and I can only speak for Lima, Peru, I cannot speak for the rest of Latin America or, you know, other countries, is that climate change here, although it's extremely important um, and quite uh, urgent um, is not at the foreground of anyone's conversation. Um, well, always there's a group, right? There's a group for whom it's extremely important all the time. Um, but for I would say for the great majority, it is not currently the top priority. And I think one of the reasons why um, you can see this becoming the top priority in places like Europe or maybe not the states yet sometimes a bit um but europe is that uh, the the general population has had a sudden very rude awakening to climate change um directly related to changes in the weather um and how you know 
the summers are unbearable, the winters are unbearable, um, you know, more so than they used to be, or things are, you know, seasons are changing at the wrong time. Some seasons are lasting longer than they used to or are being shorter than they used to. Um, in Lima, which is equatorial, right, we are in Lima, we are on a very thin strip of desert. We don't see climate change every day. You know, oh, I can say today, oh, you know, today is, you know, the 29th of November. It should be sunnier. Like we should be pretty much getting very much into summer right now. That's probably affecting a number of animals and species that we have in the area. However, it's not enough to make me uncomfortable. Right. It's just like, oh, yeah, you know, well, instead of it being sunny, I'll just put a cardigan on. You know, it's nothing that is changing my life. It's not affecting the amount of water that I'm getting, not directly. Like I haven't had any, uh, you know, the government hasn't cut any basic sort of water electricity. Like none of that has been affected yet. Um, so it's much harder, I think, for us to to get there right now. And with regards to pests, we already have tropical climate. So, you know, we're already warm. So we're not getting more insects than we had before. Um, that's not something that we're going to notice, for example, in the museum world, in the collection world, we're getting the same insects. Um, they might be around for a little bit longer because our seasons might be shifting a little bit, but we've always had so much trouble dealing with them anyway. Um, and we've never had air conditioning, most of us. We've never had heating. Um, but you know, depending on the place you live, obviously I can't speak for, I don't know, Sao Paulo. I can't speak for you know, Buenos Aires or any of these other smaller places in Latin America or around the world that have museums. Um, but we've never had the budget um, from my experience to put in climate control measures. So while in Europe and Canada and the States, people are talking about bringing back these measures, you know, turning down the air conditioning, you don't need this much heating. Actually, we're going to expand, you know, the, 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 the temperature and the relative humidity that we really need in museums because collections are fine. You know, all these conversations, um, we've never been there. We never had those resources. We never burnt that, you know, energy in that particular way for us to be like, oh no, we need to back out. We, there's nothing for us to back out from, unfortunately. Unfortunately, maybe today, fortunately. Um, but it's one of those things that I, I always heard collections people complaining about um, before the climate change issue came to the fore. It's like, oh, we don't have air conditioning. We don't have heating. When it's cold, it's cold. When it's damp, it's damp. You know, whatever we've got outside is coming in through the window. We don't have double glazed windows. We don't, we're not sealing anything. You know, uh, uh, some of us didn't even have to worry about harsh winters and having, you know, very sealed buildings because uh, one, it's very expensive to do here. And two, it's not bad enough that, you know, you're going to die inside if you don't seal your buildings up. So the insects have been coming in and out, you know, and the, and the humidity between the inside and the outside is probably very similar, except for some maybe buffering, you know, building buffering. Um, so it's really interesting to see how this conversation plays out um, in the global north versus in the global south and unfortunately precisely because we don't have those problems yet um it makes it harder i think for the global south sometimes to talk about climate change to talk about um the the issues that come with uh you know global warming and and the insects and everything because we might not be seeing it yet and uh, maybe some of my colleagues that I know are in the crowd from uh, Chile, Brazil, maybe they can, um, you know, say, oh, well, you know what, no, you're talking nonsense. That's just Peru. That's not, you know, that's not in Chile. That's not the way it works in Brazil or in Malaysia. I think I saw, yeah, someone from Malaysia. So I think it's an interesting conversation, especially if you don't live on an island as well, right? Um, people who live in atolls who are going to be severely affected by the rising uh, waters have been worrying about this for much longer than Europeans, for much longer than, than South Americans. Um, and it's sort of like, we're all getting there 
as it affects us. Um, and it's very sad that it has to work that way. But yeah. Pascal, yeah. have you been um, have you been monitoring? Well, that's perhaps the wrong word. <laughs> have you been looking to places that have climates that the Austrian climate might become to look for ideas for what you might do in the next decades? Um, no, not, not really. We, we have our Central European climate here. Of course, um, Austria also changes from region to region and we have more Alpine areas uh, with a little bit different climate. But um, here what we see is the, the general increase of temperature in the summer months, which really make it very hot. And uh, this makes um, just visiting a museum or also very hot if you don't have a climate control. So uh, if, if thousands of visitors come into a museum every day, like in some of the palaces that we have here, of course, they're opening the windows to ventilate. And of course, we have an increase of animals coming from outside. So this is, this is a direct effect, uh, which is problematic. It has to do with the high numbers of visitors, but also with the high temperatures. And many historic buildings, we cannot install uh, climate control so easily. It's not possible because they are historic and uh, um, they, are, they are not built for, for being uh, regulated the climate. So I think this is, this is quite a big challenge. And the second thing is that we have these uh, extreme weather events. We have uh, flooding, we have uh, strong rains in short periods. And this also increases uh, the humidity and the fungi growth if there's a flooding in, in certain areas. And um, of course, many big museums are uh, inside of cities. They have the budget, they have climate control. But of course, we have hundreds or thousands of very small regional museums which don't have a conservator as a staff member. And they also don't have the possibilities that the big museums have. So their situation is similar to yours, Angelica, that of course they can, they can wish for things, but they cannot install it, they cannot uh, fund it. So they are faced with changes which directly affects their collections already. Mm. And um, I think this is something that we have to, we have to try to deal with and find out how can we find simple and uh, cheap solutions to, to, to face these challenges? Not every museum will have a budget to install an HVAC system like yours in, in South America. But yeah. um, if the, the situations become that problematic that the temperatures really increase that much that it's um, unbearable to visit the collection, to visit the museum, or for the staff to work in the rooms because they are south facing. And you have, uh, in the past, we had a few days of 32 or 33 degrees, but uh, maybe in the future they will have weeks of this temperature and people cannot work properly anymore at these temperatures. And uh, this will also affect how we how we can do our work inside of the collections. Mm. This makes me think, Pascal, since you have been working with historic buildings and IPM, and um, this is something that I have thought about before. I've never actually um, sort of had the opportunity yet to talk to, say, you know, engineers that that deal with, for example, building ventilation. So I'm wondering about what the status is right now of our research into buildings that ventilate or, you know, into buildings that sort of self-regulate in terms of the, the climate yeah. inside. Because, you know, sometimes, obviously old buildings, is not, you know, they've already built, you can't, you know. But, you know, what kind of changes, if any, could we implement into either buildings that are old or into building new buildings that makes them more, say, easy to, to regulate with mechanical 
means. So for example, my house right at home in, in the summer, there are two particular doors that I have in the kitchen. I don't know if this was done on purpose, but if I open the one that leads to the garden and I open the one that leads to the garage, I get this crazy breeze that just goes straight through. Um, and I could be extremely hot anywhere else in the house. But if I sit right close to that corridor, I'm actually cold, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just the way that the building works with the current you know, air that, you know, with the way the air moves in this particular area of where I live. Um, so I guess my question is, do you know if we've got anyone researching, perhaps not obviously for conservation, but, you know, in, 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 the, in the civil engineering or in the architecture bit world, where we could use these um, sorts of Katya, you, yeah? Yes, yes. Well, I think um, this is this is fascinating that we're getting into a variety of different topics. And this, these questions that you've just thrown up are going to actually be a part of what we will all talk about tomorrow, mostly. So you've just pushed us into tomorrow, I'm going to bring you back um, into today because we have a bunch of questions um, from our audience. And I'll, um, I'll start with this one. Um, I think it's for Pascal. Um, the first question is, has anyone done any research into traditional methods of pest control in Europe? For example, using chestnuts in drawers as a repellent used to be mentioned. So it's, um, my, I'm going to reframe the question in, in a pointed way. So what about European indigenous um, pest management solutions? Because we're always thinking about indigeneity within a non-European, non-global North context, but we do have indigeneity in, uh, in Europe and um, there are potentially things to learn. Yeah, um, when, when I started with IPM, I think it was already the situation that people try to uh, lose yes, less these uh, traditional methods and uh, go for alternatives like uh, freezing, heat treatment, uh, anoxia, and uh, doing other preventive measures. So this is the way I was taught IPM by Bob Child and David Pinninger. And this is already also the, the way we teach it today in, in our courses. And uh, over the past, I've been asked many times if these uh, traditional methods like lavendula oil, uh, camphor, sh should be used or why they were used or why they're not used anymore. And um, I don't think they are very well researched. I think they, the, the history of IPM in Europe and these repellents is that, of course, we had many centuries when they were used traditionally by people at home and also by, by museum staff. And then there came the, the time of the chemical industry and the pesticides that were, uh, that pushed away these natural products and maybe ma mainly by uh, marketing, those biocides were more effective or they were already uh, on reality more effective. And those natural products were already used less in, inside of homes and also museums, but they were always there. And they, you can still buy these products today and people still use it, but if a product is not 100% effective to prevent an infestation, then for me, it is not really a very good uh, tool in IPM to protect our collections. And uh, natural products that we have available, they are not that effective anymore, or they're not effective at all. Maybe they were in the past, or maybe they were never that effective. But I've seen uh, biscuit beetle infestations in lavendula bags, which were supposed to protect them, uh, the textiles from a moth infestation. So if I have another problem because it's a plant and it's attracted by biscuit beetles, 
then it's uh, difficult for me to to apply it in the in the future. So mm -hmm. I think um, we we really have this history of uh, chemicals and pesticides being readily available, being pushed and applied in many different areas, agriculture, home IPM, museum IPM, and so on. So people partly have forgotten to use them. And um, for me, I, I'm always happy to try new products and uh, research historic uh, products, but I'm quite skeptical that they are really a a good addition to our IPM that we have. And um, from my personal point of view, good prevention, good monitoring, good cleaning are the are more important parts of IPM than uh, using natural products as a repellent. If I cannot trust them 100%, if they are 100% effective, I'm, I'm very happy to discuss it. And like I said before that, uh, in Sri Lanka, they are applying the oil to the palm leaves to protect them. If I ask here at the National Library in Vienna, if they would apply these oils to the, to the leaves in their uh, library, of course, they would never do that. So I think it, these things are very, I, I don't want to change this because I think it's good if in Sri Lanka, the situation is very different. They have tropical climates, they have termites, they have beetles, which are much more destructive than our animals here. So the pressure of pests is much higher. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, we have also our way of uh, dealing with these conservation issues. And in some areas, maybe we are more conservative. So I think it's always good to, to be open, to discuss, and to, to get new ideas, but um, changing the, the, the attitude of a conservator in a, in a museum in Central Europe is not so easy, of course. They will not e readily use tropical plants in their collections just because they are, they are maybe new products on the market, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of our next questions gets um, right to this matter, namely, um, so, and since you've touched on this, uh, Pascal, maybe, and Angelica, you can talk about <clears throat> whether what you are using, um, the kind of traditional repellent plants, or also the products that you're applying, are they compatible with the material of the museum artifacts? Mm -hmm. And um, how often are they applied? Right. And then the there are lots of kind of sub questions. Um, yeah. Considering the growth stages of the insects in the yeah. long term, yeah. um, how is this also important? Yeah, so I should clarify something. I'm not applying anything to anything yet. Um, we're, <laughs> okay. we're not applying anything. You're applying to your, we're not. You're applying yourself to thinking about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are applying ourselves to researching um, Tarwi. Um, we haven't even finished the studies or all the studies that we would like to do. We haven't already tested. We haven't done a lot of research and therefore I'm not applying anything to museum objects. Please don't do that, um, ideally. <laughs> if you don't know, if you're not 100% sure what's going to happen to that object 10 years from now, even a month from now after you apply something on it, then don't. Um, <laughs> We are still in the learning phase. We think that tarwi is a promising material for IPM. We don't know, as Pascal said, if it's 100% effective. It might not be. Um, and as he says, when you don't have something that gives you 100% effectiveness with, with insects, the problem is that they grow to 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 withstand it and then over time kind of like um like uh, like antibiotics right if you don't kill the bacteria right then it learns and then the next time you have to use more antibiotics and the next time you have to move and it's the same problem that we get with the toxic 
pesticides, right? If that doesn't kill everything, then you're pretty much screwed because the insect is gonna get the insects are gonna get better, right? Um, so what we're doing with these traditional pest controls is we know that they work as repellents, right? In in general, in the wild, insects tend to choose something else to eat because that plant is not tasty. It's not good for them. Um, we know based on our very few tests that it reduces their lifespan. So we know that if, you know, it won't, might not kill all of them, but it might kill them in a shorter amount of time than they otherwise would have lived, right? Which would give them more time to infest material. Will that make those insects stronger in the next generation? Maybe, and that could be a problem. Um, so we haven't done these yet. Um, we study, We started these tests in 2019 and we got locked up in March, 2020. So they gave us the money in December, 2019. And they were like, go. And we're like, great. We started looking to buying things. And then March, 2020, lockdown, right? So we've done these tests, very limited conditions. Um, we didn't have a lab for most of the project. Um, so we are still not to the point where I can recommend that anybody do this, where I can recommend that anybody apply this in a museum setting, because we haven't done it yet. So I don't know what would happen. Uh, Great. Yeah. Okay, we have a very highly rated question. I have a lot of exclamation points next to it, which is, do you have suggestions for sustainably treating a large space rather than select items? Um, this person is interested in ethical treatment of a very large storage space. Take it away. That's a big question, Pascal. <laughs> hmm, that's a difficult question. So it's a, it's um, it's an empty space, or it's a space full of objects and materials. So uh, for Treating rooms or buildings in, uh, in, in Europe, we don't have too many options. We have one toxic, uh, toxic gas, sulfuryl difluoride, which is used sometimes to treat churches, uh, open air museums, uh, mills. It's used in the, in the US um, to, to treat against termites. So whole buildings are treated with this chemical uh, and it's a toxic gas, highly toxic also to us humans. So this is applied for large scale treatments that I know if we want to, if we don't want to use chemicals, uh, then it becomes a lot harder because we cannot seal a building to do a nitrogen or carbon dioxide treatment. We can use warm air as a treatment method, but of course, the larger the volume is of the, of the room, the more energy, the longer it will take to heat it up to, to 55 degrees uh, centigrade. So I think this is a quite a difficult question if you really have a large storage room, um, if it the question is, what is the infestation? Is the infestation in the building part? Is it a wooden building? Or is it uh, inside of the mobile objects? And uh, the mobile objects, we can transfer them to a freezer. We can transfer them to a nitrogen bubble. We have different objects. But when the, when the pests are actually inside of the building, it becomes a lot more complex and difficult. Yes, I, I agree with that. And I would add, so yeah, based on, on, on that difference, right, whether the problem is the space itself or the objects in the space, which happens to be large. Um, I don't know if this would work. I've never had to do this, but I would probably, if you know, if you want to do it ethical and by ethical, I don't know if you mean like humane killing of the insects or if you mean in like friendly towards climate change in terms of the energy and the carbon that we use to to do the treatment um but i would say it certainly would be possible to block off 
part, you know, in a microclimate sense of sort of like in the way that we do micro microclimates for preventive conservation. Um, I, I would say you could probably do microclimate types for types of object objects based on the type of insect that you know is in there. So if you have like a bunch of objects that have a particular type of moth and you know the cycle of that moth and the requirements of that moth, I would say it would be possible in theory to group them in a bubble, in some sort of container, and I don't know, drop the RH to the point where those, um, you know, just, just dry it out maybe if the objects can take it or you know just sort of do do it in a like a group by group basis until you go through the room um so that you don't have to say fumigate the actual room right um but yeah if it's a lot of objects it's going to be hard anyway um one more possibility, which is also still quite a new product, uh, a new treatment method, is the use of parasitoid wasps, which is yeah. applied sometimes in uh, in buildings. And uh, we have some wasps which are killing the larvae of different uh, pests like biscuit beetles or Anobium punctatum. So if we know that this is the correct uh, pest, this can be applied, uh, but of course, also for a larger volume, you, you need a lot of uh, wasps and uh, this might be an expensive solution. Hmm. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and then the, the other questions might be excellent to discuss in the breakout rooms, which will follow. So um, just to get a little bit of uh, different um, words and ideas in here, there's a question um, for Pascal about whether there are any recommendations or baselines for monitoring mold and microbial activity, for example, inside or outside of jars of fluid preserved specimens. So I think we're getting the natural history crowd here. I'm not really an expert on microorganisms and fungi, so I'm not quite the right person to ask these questions. I think if something is preserved in alcohol, this prevents fungi growth on the, on the objects themselves. Um, if fungi is growing inside of a, a room, this is always related to the microclimate and the, the humidity. So fungi spores are everywhere. And if they have the conditions to grow, uh, which means they have um, organic materials to as, as a food source, and they have the humidity and the right temperature, then they will grow anywhere. So I think this is something that we have to keep in mind if we want to prevent fungi growth in any kind of uh, room storing a collection, then we have to mainly look at the, the, the microclimate, not only the climate in the room, because uh, the microclimate on the outside wall, on the floor, uh, behind the shelf can be different from what we are measuring in the center of the room. So in our project, we are also comparing room climate with microclimate uh, on the floor and in the cracks, because this is the climate which is more relevant for the insects and the fungi. Great, thank you so much. All right, we are two minutes ahead of time, which means that we have a little bit more time um, for the break. Thank you so much, Angelica and Pascal. We will see you um, immediately and also um, in, in the breakout rooms. Um, so now we'll take a short break before our speaker session. Um, it will be five minutes. So please come back at 10 past whatever time you're at. <laughs> oh, and if you're in India, I guess it's, uh, it's 40 of whatever time you're at. Um, and thank you so much again to our dialogue. I think it was a wonderful opportunity to start this wonderful conference.
Thanks and see you in five minutes. Please use the time to suggest different breakout rooms, themes, ideas that you have, or just coffee. Thank you and see you in five minutes. Hello, everyone. We are back. I hope you are back. Before our first talk, I'd like to remind you to use Slido again from, um, from the last session that just ended to collect questions for our speakers. Um, at this point, I would like our first speaker to turn on his video. Our first talk is with Udaya Cabral. Please turn on your video. Udaya Cabral is a conservator specializing in mural paintings, archaeological artifacts, and paper materials. He is currently assistant director for conservation at the National Library of Sri Lanka and director of International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions Preservation and Conservation Center, Sri Lanka. Over to you, Udaya Cabral. Thank you. Good morning, all of you. I would like to present a new herbal extraction innovated by the National Library of Sri Lanka based on the indigenous knowledge of family manuscript tradition practiced from 3rd century BCE to 18th century CE. Family manuscripts are the ancient writing medium of Sri Lanka. It had been used for writing purposes in many South and East Asian countries since 3rd century BCE until paper was introduced to the Sri Lanka. Thousands of palm leaf manuscripts have been well preserved and protected as cultural objects. The palm leaf writing tradition was no longer practiced in the society because paper materials had replaced it at the beginning of the 19th century. The techniques used for the preparation of palm leaf manuscript varied from country to country and were unique to the cultural context of each country. According to the great chronicle Mahavansha, the production of palm leaf manuscripts commenced in Sri Lanka in the 3rd century BCE after the introduction of Buddhism from India. Here are some uh, <clears throat> three species used for the preparation of palm leaf manuscript in South Asian region. Uh, there are several three species used for the preparation of palm leaf manuscript. Borosus fabulifera and Corypha umbilifera are growing in Sri Lanka. The first two species of the paper. Uh, to create the palm leaf manuscript, the leaves of the species were subjected to a number of traditional processes. Here you can see uh, <clears throat> the techniques used for the preparation of palm leaf manuscript in Sri Lankan context. The mature flower bud was cut down once the flower appeared in the tree's pinnacle. Here the first page you can see the uh, palm tree uh, flower at the top of the tree at the pinnacle. Uh, and the leaves were boiled in the water mixed with several medicinal plants. You can see it here, boiling the, palm leaf, uh, the leaves with the medicinal plants. So dry, le dry leaves were macerated in the open environment for several days before used for writing. Presently, ancient palm leaf manuscripts are distributed across the country. Many ancient temples are housed for them in government museums, libraries, 
archives providing shelter for the palm leaf manuscripts. During the colonial period, however, a large number of palm leaf manuscripts were brought abroad. A large number of palm leaf manuscripts have been well preserved in institutions in the United Kingdom, especially a British museum. Cuneville collection is very famous in the world, consisted of 2020, 2,227 palm leaf manuscripts. In Canada, France, Germany, and elsewhere, many palm leaf manuscripts are deposited and preserved well. Some collections are available as online catalogs or indexes. On occasion, a herbal extract was applied to the surface of the palm leaf for protection and to make the letters visible. It was believed that by applying the herbal extract to the surface of palm leaf manuscripts, they could be protected from environmental factors for up to 300 years. The formulation of the herbal extraction was unknown and it came from generation to generation through herbal, herbal transmission. Only a few families knew the extraction recipe at the beginning of the 19th century. Mr. Panmiller, the last descendant of such a family, once revealed the recipe and wrote it down in a symbolic way. <clears throat> Based on Mr. Panmiller's evidence for the safeguarding of palm leaf manuscripts in Sri Lanka, the National Library of Sri Lanka may be able to produce an improved version of herbal extraction as a result of extensive research. Resin obtained from Halvatulia acuminata, a tree growing tropics in the main ingredient of, the, of this herbal extraction. The commercial product of the National Library of Sri Lanka the Panghinga, the herbal extraction, has been widely distributed across the country for the safeguard of palm leaf manuscripts against tropical climate. There is a common conservation issues in the tropics. Sri Lanka is an island in the Indian Ocean located near to the equator, just below the Indian subcontinent. Sri Lanka receives around 5,000 mm of rain per year from the northeast and northwest monsoon winds, particularly in the country's central hill country. A large, short, short, a very short dry season and a long rain season or wet season are obvious. The average temperature of 25 degrees of Celsius to 28 degrees of Celsius and the average relative humidity of 85% to 90% have an impact on cultural objects stored in various institutions across the country. Chemical, physical and biological degradation processes are accelerated due to this climatic condition. As heating, ventilation and air condition systems are not installed in many cultural institutions. Biological deterioration such as insect pest attacks and more and mildew outbreaks is common in the cultural country compared with the other conservation issues. Here are the common uh, insect fits found in libraries, archives and museums in the country. The fish in the order of Coleoptera are very significant as they play a vital role in damaging cultural collections, especially paper waste collection. The Pseudomus sericon or the secret beetle is a common in the collections across the country. Stachobium penicium has also been identified on numerous occasions in the collections. Their damage is very, very severe, very difficult to control them when they infested in the collection. Some other coleopterans 
commonly found in Sri Lanka are Castellus indicus and Drenos coloratus, uh, are very common. Castellus meticolis has been discovered in Sri Lanka recently for the first time in a specific collection. Different species germinate rapidly during the rain season. <clears throat> Both larvae and adults are active in the collections throughout the year. Damage to the collection is very severe and difficult to restore. Here is the second common insect pest found in country. Silverfish or the order Sigentoma are the second most common insect species found in the collections. Lepisma saccharina. Tinolepisma nigra, Tinolepisma longicudata were well identified. But several other species remain to be identified. They are also active throughout the year and damage is not as severe for, as coleopteran species. And they are very easy to control and damage as the damage is uh, not severe as polyopteran and it is the silverfish can be controlled very easily the third common insect pest is isoptera the two categories of termites subterranean termites and dry wood termites they play a potential role in the decoration of library materials in the central part of the country Subterranean termites cause extensive damage and are only active during the rain season. National Library of Sri Lanka produced herbal extraction that were tested against common insect pest. Both natural and artificial age samples showed high repellent properties. It affected the tunnel behavior of the Coptomus or subterranean termite species. The experiments were conducted at the Federal Institute for Material Research and Testing in Berlin. Not only insect pest, microbes also boil rapidly in the tropical climate. Mold and mildew growth on paper materials is also another conservation issue due to the climatic condition. This is a burning problem not only for collections but also for staff and breeders. Because when staff and breeders are uh, sensitive for the mold and mildew and uh, sometimes especially in the central part of the uh, country, National Library has many complaints because of uh, mold and mildew. During the dry season, dust accumulation increases and the mold and mildew germinate quickly in associate with the dust during the rain season. Aspergillus and penicillin species are very common in the uh, collections. Antifungal properties of the herbal extractions were confirmed after it was tested on common fungus stains found in paper materials. This herbal extraction is moderately fungicidal. The antifungal properties were tested at the National Research Institute of Cultural Heritage in South Korea. For the conclusion, Sri Lanka is located in a tropical zone. We are inherited environmental factors, particularly temperature and relative humidity are detrimental to the preservation and degradation of cultural artifacts. The innovation of Panghi, the herbal extraction produced by National Library of Sri Lanka, based on the indigenous knowledge embedded with the palm leaf writing tradition would be a solution for controlling biodegradation of cultural properties. The herbal extraction has proven its high insect repellent properties even when exposed to tropical environmental for long period. It also showed moderate insecticide properties and moderate antifungal properties too.
this herbal extraction can be introduced to the other tropical countries that have similar conservation issues. Further research on this herbal extraction is essential for the improvement of this product. Thank you for your attention. Katya, you're muted. Thank you. We will move right along to our second talk with Agnes Brockerhoff, who works Hello. as a... Hello. Great to see you. Um, Agnes Brockerhoff works as a senior scientist at the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands in Amsterdam. She started her career in the previous century introducing integrated pest management strategies in museums and developing pest control methods that are friendly to objects, humans, and the environment. Take it away, Agnes. Yeah, no, this is the most exciting part of it all. Can I share the right screen? Ta -da. Am I there? You see my presentation? Yes, you are. That's nice, amazing. It looks beautiful. Lovely, lovely, lovely. I lovely. love the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. Yeah, climate change is definitely worrying, but every crisis offers new opportunities as well. And I like to look at the sunny side of things. So um, I would also like to share some positive thoughts with you. Now, you need a change for a crisis or the other way around, you need a crisis for a change. And in 1962, Rachel Carson made us aware of the environmental crisis people were causing by protecting their food and crops by killing pests with pesticides. Not only the insects died, so did the birds that fed on the insects and the whole food chain after it. The birds were no longer singing in spring. A major impact came from the chlorinated hydrocarbons, DDT, lindane, malathion. They were such a promise when they were discovered in the late 1930s. Paul Hermann Müller even received the Nobel Prize for DDT in 1948. But after Rachel and the rise of environmental protection movements all over the world, DDT was banned in many countries in the 1970s. We needed an alternative. In agriculture, integrated pest management, IPM, was introduced. A circular model based on understanding what you're dealing with, know thy enemy, preventing pests to live on crops, monitoring their presence, intervention when needed, with chemicals as a last resort, evaluating and adjusting the cycle where needed. And this cycle fits very nicely with the crop, crop growing year. Now, IBM also entered the museum world. In various countries, sort of simultaneously, it started growing in the late 1980s, 1990s, coinciding with the publication of the preservation framework from the Canadian Conservation Institute, in which pests are one of the 10 agents of deterioration. The framework looks at various levels and stages at which to focus action to improve preservation. The five stages being avoid, block, detect, confine, control, or in some agents it's avoid, block, detect, respond, recover. And in my early IPM work for museums, I arranged these stages in this lazy eight figure avoid, block, detect, and as long as you don't detect anything, you're in the safe prevention zone, everything works well. However, if you do detect a problem, you have to respond, confine, don't let it spread, some sort of control and come back to detect that all the problems have gone and you're back in the green zone. That's the idea of the, the lemnus cat of life, which works with every aspect of problem you deal with in life. 
I'm not delving into that now. Um, what can we face with climate change in these stages? That's, of course, one of the, the central questions for today. Now, for the first three stages, avoid, block, detect, we do meet new species. And in the Netherlands, for example, we have the Mediterranean bugs, the Western conifer seed bug, the mottled shield bug. They move up north. Um, we already had cluster flies, but they're getting more in numbers. We're not actually a Mediterranean country in the Netherlands, relatively far up north, but it is warming up and the east of our country is attractive enough for these bugs to come to and spend the winter in attics in our houses and towers of castles, usually somewhere up high and dry and warm. is most of all annoying. Um, they don't do much. They just lie there seemingly dead, but they're actually asleep. They wait till spring until they fly out and mate. The trick is that they have this aggregation pheromone. <clears throat> so if one of them has found a nice spot, it attracts the others by releasing its pheromone. And before you know it, you have your floor full of these sleeping creatures. What can you do? You get your vacuum cleaner, clean them up, mechanical removal of them. Uh, if you step on them, they stink. So you don't want to do that. That's why you remove them. Also, you have to block your building, make sure that they can't come in through crevices and little cracks. Um, and you have to clean the building such that the smell of the pheromones, which we don't smell, but they do, um, is removed. Otherwise, they come back next year. So that's one example of what's what we're facing. Fortunately, the termites haven't reached us yet. I think they're as far north as Paris at the moment, but they will move on as it gets warmer. By then, the whole Netherlands is flooded and they'll move south again. For steps four and five, the confine and especially control, we seem to um, go back to old methods using cold. Angelica also mentioned that already, low temperatures, high carbon dioxide concentrations, um, low oxygen anoxia and high temperatures, heat. Now, in this case, uh, you see how the old Egyptians stored their grain in silos under the ground. This is an archeological dig somewhere in Egypt. And the, the trick of these silos was that they put the grain in, sealed them closed, and through a limited fermentation process inside, you created, or the grain created its own low oxygen environment, and hence it could be stored for a long time and whatever lived in there would die eventually as well. Nowadays, we do it a bit fancier. And yes, Angelica, this is not how you would do it in Peru, but we in the Netherlands are fortunate enough and rich enough to be able to build large low oxygen treatment rooms. Um, the disadvantage of the treatment is that it takes relatively a long time before all stages of insects are killed. And indeed, you need special materials, equipment and energy. Now, in our case, we have a roof full of solar panels, which means that our energy consumption uh, is, is fully generated by ourselves and with clean energy. However, it takes rather an investment. You can use smaller um, setups as well with generators in bags, or you can even do on-site treatments of, in this case, uh, an organ in a church. And Pascal already mentioned that the problem in Europe is that low oxygen atmospheres are nowadays considered a biocide and we need national authorization to use it. It's a bit of a hassle, an expensive hassle as well, but thanks to the good work of Pascal and the German colleagues, European member states are now in the process of application for authorization and we can legally use our rooms again. The faster alternative is heat. One hour at 55 degrees centigrade kills everything. And heat can be used in fancy chambers indeed with relative humidity controlled. You can also just connect a hot air blower to a container and do it a bit simpler. You can even wrap a whole building in plastic and 
take hot air blowers and pump hot air into the bubble. Again, it requires materials, equipment, and energy. Therefore, back in the 1990s, when I worked at the um, CSIRO's Stort Grain Research Lab in Australia, I looked into the possibility of solarization using solar power to generate heat. My solution was the solar tent. Little did I know that Tom Strang in Canada had the same brilliant idea and was working with all sorts of frames and envelopes. And maybe he'll talk about that later on as well. The principle of the solar tent is like parking your car in the sunshine. The solar radiation passes through the windshield, heats up dark surfaces like the dashboard, and the heat can't go anywhere, while, so the whole interior warms up. Now, the tent also has an outer sheet of clear plastic and a black surface underneath, black surface with white stripes, come back to that. Um, and the cold air warms up goes to the top where it's hot and enters the tent while it pushes out the cold air that's still at the bottom and you get this lovely circle where ge um, gently the whole interior temperature raises. The white stripes are there to have a better air circulation than if you just had a black surface. Um, in this way, the interior of the tent heats up to over 60 degrees centigrade, enough to heat up thin objects like paper, but also medium-sized wooden objects to 55 degrees in their core for an hour during a one-day treatment. That is to say, this worked in Australia, not in the Netherlands. I couldn't even melt a peck of butter in it. Not enough solar power, too low outdoor temperature, too much wind. But now, thanks to global warming, it can be done in the Netherlands. Obviously, you can't treat everything in a solar tent or with heat in general. There are side effects for materials with a relatively low melting point. But a lot can be treated without problems or the problems are at least smaller than your objects being eaten by hungry insects. It's often weighing one risk against the other. So yes, you get some color change if you have wood with lots of resin in it, varnish softens, but that can also be called regenerating the, the craculeur in it. Um, Australian bark paintings would warp, but that was reversible, they would come back. So many, many kinds of material and objects I threw in the tent and they came out all right. For large flat objects, such as tapestries, carpets, there is the option of an envelope having some sort of insulation at the bottom um, and then covering it with black plastic and some transparent sheet on top. The transparent on top is mainly to stop the, the air cooling. And this used to be just feasible in the Netherlands. And now you can do it without any worries at all. You easily reach the right temperatures. So to conclude, first of all, it's very important to watch this whole process while it's going on, it takes a day. Um, Yes, the required temperatures can be used with solarization and heat is effective against all developmental stages of insects. It doesn't cause any resistance in the long term. And if you wrap your objects in a plastic bag, you can avoid moisture loss and drying out, which is one of the reasons why fancy chambers have RH controlled warm air coming in, but there's much simpler ways to solve that. Um, be careful that you avoid temperature gradients with warm and cold sides of objects because um, you could get some moisture movement in that case and, and condensation. So you need to make sure that the air is distributed well throughout the space. Um, keep these side effects in mind if you have materials that are sensitive for raised temperatures. But the good thing is, 
you can do this with all sorts of recycled materials, some pieces of wood, cardboard from old cardboard boxes, plastic sheet can usually be find, found anywhere. So it doesn't need to cost anything at all, plus your energy is for free. Altogether, solarization is an inexpensive alternative control method to all the other fancy ones. And now it's even possible in countries like the Netherlands. If you want to read more about this, there's a number of publications uh, on the internet, even a whole instruction manual of how to build your own tent, which of course is even much more fun if you make your own variation to the theme. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. And if you can't kill them, just love them. Thank you so much, Agnes. <laughs> that was wonderful. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, uh, we are moving on to our third presentation. Unfortunately, our third speaker is unable to attend today. However, we are very happy and delighted that Angelica Isa agreed to present her paper um, for us uh, instead of Tom Strang, and we will hear it, see it now. Please remember to write your questions in Slido. Hello, thank you for tuning into this presentation and harnessing traditional knowledge for sustainable IPM and conservation. I'm hoping to make this uh, presentation really short and dynamic, so I'm going to go through it quite quickly so that you don't get bored. And just please go ahead and ask me any questions you have at the end. So first, I want to very quickly introduce the team that oversaw this particular research project. There were quite a few people involved. Unfortunately, they have not been able to be here today. Um, and I hope you catch the little joke at the end with Trichorinus herbarius, who's the main beetle that we were studying for this project. So how did this project even begin? This picture here that you can see is a before and after, unfortunately, of a very nice archaeological incised gourd that we had at the Pachacamac Museum in Lima here in Peru about 10 years ago. Um, the picture on the left is a picture of the object when it was registered several years ago and unfortunately there was a big move in between the first picture and the second picture because the museum was being completely rebuilt. So the museum building was raised to the ground and the new museum was built on top of it so the whole collection had to go off for several years. So it got packed away then when it was registered and at that point we didn't have staff who could recognize active insect damage. So the object was already infested when it was packed away and by the time different new staff opened it again several years later it was already gone. And if you remember my first slide with the little beetle team member, that is the main pest we must worry about in the Pachacamac Museum. It's actually a very common pest in Peru because most professionals in collections care can recognize it, although it's normally not properly identified down to the species level. Um, when we started this project, we didn't even have a positive ID for what kind of insect this was. It looked a lot like a biscuit beetle, so at some point we thought it might be that or some other similar looking beetle, but we weren't sure because it's not a common pest in temperate climates, so it's not as well documented in the literature um, as the other common culprits in the global north. So, however, uh, through this project, Marilyn, our master's student in entomology, was able to actually do a full biological study all the way to an ID we, um, by looking at the male reproductive system. So we can now say we have identified it properly. So while we were identifying this insect, we were also thinking about how we were going to protect organic material from these beetles because they are extremely mobile. They fly very high and they attack mostly soft vegetable material like gourds and vegetable fiber like basketry. Um, we found them mixed in with termites in wood, although less so. And part of the seriousness of the damage they cause is that they spend over 100 days as feeding larvae, and on top of that, another 50 to 70 days as breeding adults. So you can imagine that even though their cycle is long, they can reproduce a lot and cause significant damage over time. 
So thinking about all these things, identifying the problem, identifying the beetle, thinking about preventive conservation, how we were going to try to approach this problem from a sustainable perspective, um, not just environmentally, but also economically, we started thinking about the value chain model for sustainable heritage. And you can actually read this paper because we presented it at the IAC Wellington conference this year, and it's open access. So there is a QR there uh, in the corner. And if you want to look for it, you certainly can, and you should be able to read it. Um, the point of the value chain model for sustainable heritage projects is that we should explicitly include conservation within any sort of heritage related project and try to think of the different ways in which the steps of the project are adding value to the item being researched to or to the investigation. So this value that we add as we go along through the project and then we transfer to society so that we can get enough return on the results of the project to fuel even more research or bigger projects or more collaborations in the end. So I'm going to show you very quickly how uh, we're using this particular value chain model for a project that has to do with IPM and sustainability. I'm going to start talking about tarawi now. So if you have never heard about it before, it is a type of seed. It's basically kind of like a bean and it grows on a plant that looks like this in Peru in the Andean regions. So in Peru, it is eaten because of its very high protein content and it's going to be one of these Andean superfoods kind of thing like quinoa or chia seeds along those lines. It's a very nutritious bean. And straight from the start, I can tell you that tarawi is safe enough to eat because we already do eat it. Um, all it needs before human consumption is soaking in water to get rid of the alkaloids because of that bitter taste that we don't like. So if we're going to have a biocide of any kind or repellent that is organic in nature, tarawi might be pretty much as non-toxic as it's going to get for us, you know, because it, all it takes for us to be able to eat it is to wash it in water. Now, the important thing about tarawi when we start thinking about pest control is that it has a lot of alkaloids in it, which are assumed to be the reason why the plant itself is generally quite resistant to pests. So there have been some studies with tarawi on both termites and disease transmitting mosquitoes showing that it has a good mortality rate on both of those insects. And traditionally, what we have seen in the literature is that tarawi plants are planted around other crops um, that want to be protected from pests because just the plant being there seems to be enough to dissuade certain agricultural pests from attacking the crop that's within the bounds of the tarwi hedge. So definitely something in this plant is enough to act at least as a repellent in the wild without any processing. Why did we pick tarwi to study, even though there are also other existing options such as neem or citronella that have already been used in the past and which have already been researched? So um, it's pretty obvious, but one of the reasons is that tarwi is grown here, right? It's native to the Andes, it's local. It means that we wouldn't have to go looking for you know, neem, which we do not grow in Peru. Um, and this is much more sustainable for us than trying to get a plant that is not native to the area. Another reason is that, as I said, we already eat it. So there is an existing processing industry for tarwi for the commercial food industry. And the reason why this works particularly well is that tarwi is extremely bitter in its natural state because of the high alkaloid content. So it requires thorough washing um, and soaking before it's sold as food or before it can be eaten by humans. And Tarwi Corp, which was the company that donated some of this washing effluent to us, washed the seeds before packaging. Um, and then they just throw out this aqueous waste product, which is basically water with a bit of bicarbonate in it. Um, and all the alkaloids that used to be in the seeds end up in that water. And the alkaloids are presumably the substance with the repellent or anti-feeding properties are just in this water that are, is being thrown away and is not being used for anything at all. Um, and finally, of course, this naturally sourced product is in no way petroleum based. What are some of the tests that we ran with the tarwi? So we had three different types of liquids to test. On the one hand, we made two hydroalcoholic extracts, so one with leaves and one with powdered seeds um, with alcohol. We just extracted the alkaloids by extended soaking. And then we also used the aqueous effluent as was given by Tawi Corp Company. So this is the water that they used to wash the seeds before they packaged them for human consumption. The leaf and the seed hydroalcoholic extracts were tested on both termites 
and uh, Trichorinus herbarius, while the aqueous effluent was used for alkaloid detection analysis. So I'm not going to go too deeply into these tests because this specific paper has already been published and presented at Pest Odyssey in 2021. Um, and there are still some results we haven't published, so we want to publish them soon. For the antifedent activity, our entomologist cast cut discs of filter paper separated pet petri dishes into groups of five repetitions. So we had two groups that received one milliliter of either ethanolic tawi leaf e extract or just plain ethanol, and we allowed them to dry for 48 hours. Now we had a last group that was not modified at all and served as a control group. After drying, each disc was placed in a petri dish with 30 specimens of termites, uh, Cryptotermus brevis, and their behavior was observed for 30 days in a permanently darkened chamber, uh, a breeding chamber, sorry. So to determine the feeding inhibition index, the FI index of the tarwe extract, we evaluated consumption of the papers by weighing them every three days for 30 days. So the total consumed weight allowed the calculation of the feeding inhibition index as a percentage. So we got the highest feeding inhibition percentage um, with the Tawi group at 68.4%, um, and it only reached 48.1% with the uh, just alcohol group. Based on those results, it was really great to know that having the tarweed just there reduced ingestion of the substrate of the filter paper considerably with termites. So we ran similar tests to determine repellents. We added some drops of tarweed hydroalcoholic extracts to some halves of filter paper discs and just ethanol to the other, and then ran tests with both termites and adult trichorinus beetles. So we found that while the effect was stronger with termites, there was still an element of repellents with the tarweed hydroalcoholic extract. Now, since we published the first test at Pest Odyssey last year, we have run some more tests using more repetitions with trichorinus adults and larvae. We have also tested the possibility of using biofilms made of tarwe pods to hold the tarwe extract, and we have a patent pending for that too. So while repellence tests have not been very promising, mortality certainly has. Um, we have observed the lifespan of the adult individuals in the test that ingested powdered gourd material with hydroalcoholic tarwe extract was greatly reduced compared to the observed lifespan of the mass reared insects for the biological study. For the larvae in the study that ingested the treated material, uh, they either never, reach, uh, never reached adulthood or died very shortly after. So I, I'm not going to go into further detail on these tests because we haven't published them yet. And of course, we're definitely still missing stuff, right? So this is a very exciting time for this project because we have confirmed through our initial investigations that Tawi works not only for termites, which we already knew from a previous study in Peru, but it also works on trichorinas and beetles and larvae. Um, because we ran the whole project in the middle of the pandemic, we literally got the grant in December 2019. We are missing quite a few tests and repetitions that we would like to do before we can move forward to the actual synthesization of a commercial product that could be used um, you know, commercially for, for everyone. So, for example, we have not already tested the extracts or the effluent from the factory. We have also not tested yet whether the extract or effluent would be safe to apply directly on organic objects or how these would react. Um, we have not yet done bioassays with just the aqueous effluent, although we know that they contain significant levels of alkaloids because we have run those tests. Um, we would also like to increase some repetitions for some of these tests with adult individuals. Um, this was very hard to do without a long-term lab setup because trichorinas have a rather long life cycle at around 146 days from egg to adult in artificial rearing conditions plus another 50 to 70 days as copulating adults so there's still a number of tests we are missing in order to make this a product that would be completely petroleum based free I'm just going to come back to this slide that we saw at the beginning to talk about how this project was designed from the start to attempt to achieve its own sustainability, um, not just in economic ways, but also environmental aspects. We had embedded an idea of sustainability into the project from its inception, and this was just one of several sub-projects we ran as part of a much bigger project for research of Peruvian heritage. So this particular sub-project was born in part because of the lack of access we have in Peru to conservation-grade materials and solutions that are common or easy to get in the global north. So we needed something we could make ourselves, use ourselves that didn't require crazy import fees, which, uh, you know, of course, is not only expensive, but also not carbon friendly. 
Um, and I thought it was important to bring back this slide at the end now, because sustainability in the face of climate change, or even just sustainability in the ways in which we want our projects to endure over time, it really has to be built into the project from the start rather than be an afterthought. Um, and in our case, we have found that building an environmental sustainability ended up creating the potential for socioeconomic impact and economic sustainability. So that making something climate friendly ended up being, you know, ended up making other aspects easier and better rather than more expensive or more complicated as we might sometimes expect um, and thinking about it it sort of feels like in conservation we have relied a lot on really cool high-tech expensive materials that are all excellent and do the job really well but they could be very expensive and not just for us uh, acquiring them commercially but also expensive for the environment in terms of what it takes to make them. Um, and we have marketed these materials and shared them and shipped them all over the world, making them even worse for the environment by doing so. And then it turns out, as we have seen lately in more presentations about local IPM solutions, that many of us have the potential for creating local options that are way better for our pockets and for environments as well. Um, and in fact, if you look at this chart, which was made two years ago now, we hadn't explicitly put in environmental sustainability at first. I mean, that's not the slide I showed you at the beginning, right? It's sort of in there with the identification and evaluation step as well as the socioeconomic impact. Um, but you know what? We're going to amend this chart now. So here it is, um, and it's explicit. And with that last thought in mind about adding environmental sustainability considerations to the value chain model, don't forget that part of the value we build when we have projects like these are the networks we strengthen and the colleagues we meet. So I strongly encourage you to reach out to me or anyone at the Research Center for Heritage Conservation in Lima. There's the link for the center and that QR is for my LinkedIn profile. So go ahead and connect with me or with us if you wish. We'd be happy to chat. Do come down to Peru in 2024 for the IIC conference too. Um, and then maybe we can meet in person. And of course, I must thank the sponsors and strategic partners that were involved in this project and the other sub project that were part of a larger grant we got in 2019. I would especially like to thank Mr. William Trujillo of Tarwi Corp Company for the donation of the Tawi leaves, seeds and effluents that were used in our tests. Thank you again. Fantastic, fantastic. Excellent. All right. I want to reiterate what was just written into the chat. Please um, suggest topics for breakout sessions after this question and answer period. We will be taking a short break and then going into the last phase of today, which will consist of breakout sessions with the speakers um, for different topics that you suggest and just coffee station, virtual coffee stations. All right, now let us begin our Slido rated um, question and answer session with our three speakers. If you could turn on your videos. We're still waiting for Odaya, wonderful. Excellent, great to see all of you here together. So I am going to mix and match um, the questions. If, if you feel yourself needing to speak for 20 minutes on one question, do not do that <laughs> because then our time will be up. So um, please, make sure that you allow enough time for every we have a lot of questions so i want, I want to get through with people um so that people know the answers i will start first with um udaya first and most important question is there a problem if there are biocides on and in the objects regarding the activity of the parasites like the wasps? Uh, hello, I'm audible. Yes, you are. Okay. 
<clears throat> yes. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me opportunity for uh, exchange my ideas uh, with you. Uh, actually, uh, my uh, my presentation I uh, tried to uh, pointed out the herbal extraction uh, produced by National Library of Sri Lanka for the protection of uh, museum objects. So, uh, so it's it is now uh, we use it uh, at the moment uh, for the control of uh, uh, insect pest, uh, especially uh, uh, cicad beetles and uh, carpet beetles, uh, silverfish like that. Uh, so that uh, uh, we uh, use this. Uh, uh, We use this uh, uh, biocide uh, as a repellent. Uh, so we absorb. Normally, we uh, uh, keep it at the uh, collection. So that because of the smell, uh, it work as a biocide for uh, the insect repel the uh, uh, the the chemical and they, uh, get rid of the uh, collections. So it's work like that at the moment. Great, thank you. All right, I will continue with Agnes. Uh, top question. Should the weather suddenly change against the forecast, what sort of emergency procedures would you implement? Um, you know, fortunately in Australia, the weather never changed, so I didn't face that problem. <laughs> in the Netherlands, uh, yeah, it would just get too cold or might even rain. Uh, fortunately, the tent is waterproof if you have good plastic. Uh, I think that's that's why I have it on on wheels, and I can roll it in and uh, wait till a till a better moment. You are reliant on nature, so you have to be a bit give and take. Great, Angelica, do you need one hundred percent? repellent success to use tarwi and if not what level of success is enough for you how much is enough, how much is enough? <laughs> um it's really hard to just give you a number you know just come up with a number 100 percent is always ideal of course because if if they survive it, it the, the chances are the next of you know whoever survives that treatment their offspring will potentially be much more likely to survive and if this we keep doing this um you know who knows eventually it might just stop working altogether um i would like something like this to work maybe you know i'm just going to make something up i'd like 80 percent let's say 70 80 percent so that the other 30 percent i can freeze Right, so we have so many objects, and we have such a small freezer, and we only have one. Um, it's a matter of, of of resources in terms of space, in terms of how many objects can you treat at the same time before the infestation gets out of control. And this is if you catch the infestation before it's out of control, um, which unfortunately is not the case most of the time. I think most of the time, by the time you catch an infestation here it's already been out of control for a while. Um, so you're kind of having to go in there. Um, and I think that ideally this time we would help us reduce the, the, the lengthen the amount of time it takes us to get to that point where the infestation is way out of control. And it gives us this time to work with the freezer that we have or the anoxia that we do have because we can only go in small batches, right? So it's, it's, it's not going to be a, uh, one solution it's more like a tool to help us be able to do several things great that's why it also a part of the integrated approach it, yeah, it starts exactly. with the detection <laughs> and the monitoring and when you get the feeling now is really getting out of control i need to act maybe localized or yeah exactly so it's just an extra tool really rather than a solution all right, question number two for you, Udaya. For palm leaf manuscripts in collections outside of Sri Lanka that have been treated in this way in the past, are there health considerations in handling them? And should we assume that all palm leaf manuscripts have been treated if they are in good condition? I'm thinking that this might be from 
um, someone who is not located in Sri Lanka, but has palm leaf manuscripts and they are doing well, but I'm not sure. Yes, I think so because of uh, the condition in the Europe, uh, I think it's a cool condition at the very uh, low humidity. That's very uh, good for the palm leaf manuscript. So I think at the uh, palm leaf manuscript is outside the uh, Sri Lanka, especially from Europe and America and other countries are well preserved because of the climatic condition in those countries. So I think uh, not necessary to uh, treat this uh, well oil for uh, those uh, manuscripts because of the end well, well preserved in, uh, in that condition. But in Sri Lanka is completely different. The, in our case, we have high humidity level and the high temperature level. So uh, it is essential to treat this uh, uh, palm leaf manuscript by this herbal extraction by time to time, otherwise it can't survive. So uh, at the moment in Sri Lankan, palm leaf manuscript are in danger because of the climatic conditions, but the things uh, are in the abroad, especially from UK and uh, other America and other countries are very safe because of the climatic conditions uh, on those countries. Mm -hmm. I think also the question is, were they treated upon creation. So when you create the palm leaf manuscript, do you do this type of treatment to even um, make it? So is it embedded in the fabric of the material itself? Yes, uh, when, when we are when pressing the palm leaf manuscripts, uh, so they, they underwent uh, several uh, uh, treatment processes. So from the ancient time, uh, uh, the, uh, the palm leaf manuscript boil in different type of uh, herbal extractions and uh, put into some outside for maceration, some at some, some several, several plant extraction, apply those things have uh, conducted uh, during the uh, process, processing, uh, processing uh, before the uh, preparation of the palm leaf manuscript. This happened in the ancient times. So it get good potential to survive in the environment. So uh, I think it's also uh, one good plus point uh, to keep the palm leaf manuscript in good condition in addition to this herbal extraction. Uh, yes. Great, thank you. All right, Agnes. How do we reconcile smaller low-tech solutions like solar tents with conservator needs desires for the constant control of processes? <laughs> um, yeah, relax. <laughs> How's that um, working? <laughs> it, it, it happens automatically when you grow older, I can tell you. I used to be very much in control and now I'm not. Um, but I think, again, this, this integrated approach very much has a focus on observation detection in the, in the center of it. And from there, you start thinking, what can you control? What can you avoid and block on the one hand? And if you have to treat, act, how can you do that in the smartest way? And... That also means that your control, you're, you're wanting to control the whole process has to also be more integrated in its thinking and looking at where do you need to control strictly and where can you relax more? I'm not sure if that's the, the answer to the question, but. I think it is in a kind of psychological way, yes. And I'm, I'm happy that you answered it in that manner. Um, I think it also, kind of connects with sunlight, but what the slide you started your presentation with, which is sunset, which is also about light, but at a time, at a specific time. Yeah, I hope it's not my sunset yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, now we have Angelica, what are the biggest pest challenges for you that make Tarwi more attractive than other options? Yes, the, there are a number of, of challenges. One of them I mentioned is that the products that we have here that are commercially made are not regulated, so they are not forced to tell you what's in them. So I, I can't buy anything and know what's in it here. If I try to import something, 
it's very expensive. It's at least double or triple the price because you have to add the costs of shipping. And then sometimes I can't even get them out of customs because they, they retain them. Um, another thing is that um, we have, as I said, you know, at least at work, one small freezer. Uh, most collections don't even have one small freezer. So our options for actual treatment anoxia, we can't get escal in Peru. It, it's just really hard or impossible to get the high level gas barriers that you need for anoxia bags. Um, we haven't tried the solar panel yet, but I hope I can talk to Agnes about that later. Um, uh, so, you know, our options are very limited. So having something like Tarwi for us would help us have that time we need to make our decisions in the best way and to use our extremely limited resources in the best way. Um, and I can't get that with commercial products and I can't afford to import them. So I need to find something local. Great. And if it's environmentally friendly, even better. All right, moving along, Yudaya. Would you mind repeating the name of the plant the solution is derived from? You need to turn on your mic. So locally, uh, we call it Dummala. The plant name is Dummala. Uh, the scientific name of the plant is Helvetia accumulata. Helvetia accumulata. So the resin of that plant, uh, we uh, collect, collect from those, those are in the tropical jungles. So we, uh, the, we collect the resin from that plant and, and distillate the, the uh, resin through a special distillation machine in high temperature and uh, get the uh, final product. As a herbal extraction. Sorry, maybe you could put these names in the chat to everyone, just so that people okay. have the um, the spelling, etc. And okay. I like the consonants between um, between Yudaya and Angelica in using these local plants and trying to make something that you don't have to import and that uses uh, organically everything uh, that's, right uh, that's right around. Right around. You. Okay. Um, now we have Agnes. Has the solar tent been used in practice to tackle a real infestation anywhere? Yes, it has. Um, I know people, um, colleagues in, in Africa and I think South America contacted me and asked for descriptions and actually applied that. Um, however, I haven't heard back from them, so I don't know if they crept in the tent themselves as well, and that was it, or uh, whether it was successful. <laughs> but yeah, it has been been used, and um, the envelopes, the, the larger frames that I talked about, um, that uh, Tom Strang also has in his publications, um, are also used on occasions, but it must be said, it's, it's not a, a much used method. For me, it was also just fun to play with the concept. I think it might be very important for smaller institutions and uh, ones that are maybe more rurally located. Yeah, because absolutely. I can't imagine doing that in Manhattan. No. And <laughs> There's probably no need for it. You know, this, this was developed in, in, in times that the solar panels weren't big yet. Nowadays, you, you do it indirectly. You use your solar energy with the panels to create electricity on which you then run something. I mean, that's, that's the, the way we've chosen to use it. But if you don't have the panels in between, the direct solarization, there's also the, the principle of the, the camping shower. You have your black bag with water and you have hot water for a shower. Perfect. Excellent. Or on sailboats as well. Indeed. All right. We have now, for Angelica, do you have any concerns that Tarvi might work as a food source to attract alternate pests? Um, 
No, not really. Um, and the reason is first that we wouldn't be putting the plant in the in the in the storage areas, at least not in our current research project. Um, two, if we did put the plant in the research project, it has so many alkaloids in it. If you haven't washed it, that the person not going to want it. And it's very unlikely that they're going to eat that when they have all collections um, there that they could eat instead. Um, and three, um, because the the whatever we end up using or hope to be using will be an extraction of mostly just the alkaloids and not the actual tarwe plant, um, uh, it's unlikely that that's what more insects would come for. Um, it, so it's not going to be an attractant. In it. I I. I would be extremely surprised if it ended up working out that way. Um, it's not really a concern, no. Great. All right, moving right along. Udaya, is there a non-laboratory method to identify palm leaf manuscripts which have been treated with these toxins? For example, visible change or fluorescence, et cetera. So you mean non-laboratory uh, methods or um, non-laboratory method? No. Non-laboratory method, yes. So for example, visible change or fluorescence, et cetera. Uh, yes. So I guess walking so, yes. around the stacks with something. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, uh, normally uh, we are very familiar with the palm leaf manuscripts because it's our native uh, writing system so uh, we can observe uh, palm leaf manuscript carefully so we can see the uh, changes because some if the insect infestation we can see some uh, dust on it uh, it's a moles is there we can see some mole stains and uh, its color changes and uh, sometimes the uh, palm leaf manuscript uh, sticky uh, stick, stick together some, because of the high uh, temperature, it's uh, melted the oil and stick together. Uh, so visually, we can observe those things and no need to uh, do the laboratory uh, testing. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, we uh, do the we start to do the treatment. Uh, many, so you can see if cases, they have not been treated, or you can see if they have been treated, or you can see both. Uh, both, both, both. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, when, when we treat it by the farm, this oil, uh, after because of high uh, uh, conditions, high uh, temperature conditions, sometimes the stick uh, the leaf may be st st stick together. So uh, sometimes uh, we, we have to day-to-day uh, -day monitor the collections uh, and observe the issues. And again, again, we have to do the treatment, traditional treatment to avoid this. Great. Thank you. All right. We have now, Agnes, how do you deal with a possibility if there is any of the heat treatment damaging the objects? That's really the, the risk assessment in advance. You, you have infested objects, and then you have to choose the right method to treat them. That depends on the side effects and also on costs and time. So in, in my own case, if I have paintings, for example, panel paintings or so, I would not put them in a heat treatment. I would do a low oxygen treatment because I have the possibility to do so. If I didn't have that, I would probably choose high CO2 concentrations then freezing and if nothing else heat unless i decide the damage by the, the insects is not as big as the side effects i expect from the treatment then i may consider not to treat at all or uh, well have a good conversation with the insects and see if we can come to an agreement where they eat at a slower pace um so it's it's is weighing these things. So in, in my Buggy Biz uh, book, I have a quick sort of um, 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 selection of 
if the materials melt, if this or this, or if they're layered structures, I wouldn't go for temperature treatments because they may uh, swell and shrink in different ways. If you want to be completely safe, go for low oxygen or uh, high CO2. Most of what we do actually goes into the freezer because that's the most universal treatment. And heat is really if you want to do something fast. Great. All right, this will be the last um, question for this round, and then we will go into um, the breakout rooms where you can ask very pointed questions to the people that you want to talk to most. So, Angelica, do, are you working with indigenous populations on some of these matters? Right, um, not yet. Um, and I think one of the main reasons is that we started this project right before the lockdown. <laughs> so we, uh, we, you know, we couldn't go anywhere. Um, it's, it's definitely something that we could do when we get more funding so that we can actually go because obviously, um, you know, the places where we are growing tarry are not in Lima. We're talking about mid altitude Andes, high, higher altitude Andes. So we would have to go to very specific regions. Um, it also depends on which tarry we're talking about. Um, because obviously the, the species of the plant or the variation of the plant will be different depending on what region of Peru we are in. Um, that might end up being influenced by where the company that was providing us with the effluent tends to get their tawi from. So we will need to look with a bit more detail into location first um, as you know how this is going to fit into the whole process and then be able to do work with the indigenous populations. Although indigenous populations here is, is used in a slightly different way. So they will just be local agricultural um, you know, people who, who focus on agriculture. Um, for okay. living. Thank you. This was a wonderful, wonderful panel. I think um, there was a consonance amongst all of you. And I hope that you are flooded with questions in the breakout rooms. So we will take a very short pause so that you can attend to your physical needs of two minutes before we come back. If you have time and interest, please write into the chat that you would like to have a specific type of breakout room that you haven't seen before. Namely, um, we will have meet the speaker breakout rooms. We will have a chat about a topic rooms that you may suggest and drink a virtual coffee rooms. Um, you can make your choices in this small pause and you can also suggest new topics. Um, we will be assigned to rooms that we choose um, and that will happen at 40 past whatever hour you are. Uh, no, sorry, at 22 past whatever hour you are. So in the next two minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 